Well, good morning, everybody. Morning. Not bad, not bad. Welcome to everyone here. So great to be with you again. Um, this is one of our favorite things to do every single week is come together and just be uh, God's family. Um, normally wouldn't do this, but I have to make a big deal. My folks are in the house today. So, that's like where they always sit. So for like 12 years since we opened this building, they were always right there. So always great to have Tom and Linda Gooden in the house. So welcome to you guys and welcome to everyone. My name is Jim. If we haven't met yet, uh, I had the, just the extreme privilege of being able to serve real life as lead pastor. It's an exciting time of year, so many things going on. And uh, it's, it's just great to be in the rhythm of the Christmas season. Would you agree? That's the quiet of people who don't have their shopping done yet. Um, yeah, it's coming up. It's coming up. We're uh, in week two of our Christmas series, All I Want for Christmas. And it is just an exciting time of year. I want to say just, they're not in the room, um, but we have an entire team of people who are working hard with our kids to get ready for next week's family Christmas celebration and talking to a couple of them over the last few weeks um, they've been doing this, Julie Covert and Allie Horde and Pastor Michelle and a whole host of other people who are working together, all of our classroom coordinators. Um, Pastor Michelle said to me yesterday, I don't remember the last time it was when I got to listen to a Christmas message in the service. They're working hard, um, not just to put on a kid's pageant, but to allow the kids the, the, the privilege, the joy to teach them just the amazing story that the Christmas story really is. So when you see them next week, you make a big deal out of them. Um, it's going to be a great night. You won't want to miss it. Uh, it's next Sunday night at 6 o'clock is our family Christmas celebration. We're in week two of our Christmas series, All I Want for Christmas. I, I love the rhythm of Christmas and Advent. I love that we just get to, as a church, just slow down and refocus our hearts. We, we just allowing ourselves to be kind of recaptivated by the Christmas story, the amazing gift of Emmanuel, God with us. He's the gift to the world. He's the promised one, the Messiah. And you know, I'm kind of cheating, but it's awesome when you can just preach Jesus for four straight weeks. Uh, it's kind of who we are as a church, right? And so I hope you're excited uh, to hear it this morning. What we're doing all month long is we're just preaching. Actually, what we're, I'm kind of pulling the curtains back here a little bit. We're just preaching through the, the four Sundays of Advent. And as Erica was leading us in our Advent time together this morning, you heard her talk about uh, the, the candle of, of love. So each week what we're doing is as we celebrate Advent together, I'm actually preaching on that same topic. Advent, it's all about preparation, anticipation. It's actually this, this expectation that we build in the rhythm of our lives. What it, we step back into the story of the birth of Jesus to experience that waiting. If you took a look at your Bible and at the, the end of the Old Testament and the start of the New Testament, we turn one page and we're in the story. And God's people had to wait 400 years for that story to unfold in between those pages. So we step back into that story the, to experience the waiting, to experience the thrill of hope, the anticipation of what was to come for God's people. And we just very simply just allow ourselves to, to feel that hope, the expectation. I, I love the word, that anticipation, because we're looking forward to God's one last unfulfilled promise that he's coming back. So our theme verse is kind of the lead, the lead up to this story, uh, building the anticipation. It's really the anticipation of the, of the event that changed the entire human story. It's Matthew, Matthew 1, verse 23. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She would give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel, God with us, the gift of Jesus given to the world. And if you were with us yesterday during the kids' practice, I don't know how they know this. It must be what you guys are teaching them at home. But man, I've got an earworm because I hear Emmanuel and then I hear Wonderful Counselor from the Michael W. Smith song, Who's With Me? And if you're not, now y'all are with me because that's, that's going to be in your head. So thanks, kids at kids' 
family Christmas celebration rehearsal for that earworm today. Jesus is the gift of hope, of love, of joy, and of peace. Last week, we talked about the gift of hope. We talked about the, the prophet Jeremiah. He was called the, the sorrowful prophet or the weeping prophet. And we went to a really different place to start off our Christmas series. Rather than jumping right into the Christmas account, we jumped into Lamentations chapter 3. We saw that in, in the middle of the darkest circumstances for the nation of Israel, that there was actually a song of hope. Not because of their, their circumstances, it was in spite of their circumstances. And we took hope from that, not because of our circumstances or what we can do, but just simply because of who God is. And we made this statement last week. We said, we can stand on the promises of God because of his demonstrated faithfulness. Because he kept his promises, we can stand on the promises to come. I love that phrase in Lamentations 3, it says he renews his promises, he renews his blessings each and every morning. Next week, we're going to talk about Jesus as the gift of joy. If you're wondering why there's one pink candle up here, that's the pink candle for Advent is week number three, joy. And then in two weeks, we're going to talk about the gift of peace and just praying over these next couple weeks that we just can allow God to fill us with hope, love, joy, and peace. So today we're talking about the gift of love, and spoiler alert, it's Jesus. We can all go home. <laughs> the gift of God's unfailing love to the world is Jesus. And I actually want to uh, invite you to stand as we read scripture together today, have a, a, a meaningful moment of scripture here this morning as we read together 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. Paul writes this, thanks be to God for his undescribable gift. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let's pray together today over our time in God's word. Lord, we are so thankful for these, these moments that we've had together, the chance to come together as a church family, to experience your presence, to stop everything that we're doing and celebrate who you are and what you've done. And this time in, in your word, it's really a continuation of that very thing. Your words are so important to us. We want to slow everything down, quiet our hearts, quiet our minds, open up our ears and our spirits to receive what you have for us this morning. And so will you meet us right here in this moment as we talk about you, the gift of love. And we pray that in your name. Amen? Amen. Amen. High five someone before you have a seat this morning. It's a beautiful day, beautiful day. I should have preached about joy today with this beautiful sunrise that we've had today. But we're talking about the gift of love today, the gift of love. And as we get into the holiday season, if you weren't paying attention on your calendar, we're now just a couple days, away, a couple weeks away from the big day. And it takes a lot of preparation to get ready for the Christmas season, doesn't it? It takes a lot to get ready. It's such a great time of year. There's so many meaningful things that happen during the month of December, but it's, it can be just such an incredibly crazy busy time of year. Anyone say amen to that? It's bananas, isn't it? We look forward to getting together with friends and family and sometimes our coworkers, uh, but there's this building anticipation. I really enjoy getting together with my coworkers. I didn't want that to kind of be this awkward moment just hanging there that you didn't know what I was talking about. We look forward to this. There's this building anticipation of uh, all throughout the month and there's a lot of planning and organization and it said the word preparation that goes into our times in Christmas. We look forward to Christmas parties. Who has a baking day where you just like hunker down and take care of all of your baking for the entire month? Like, you can't just, like, whip that together. That takes planning, right? All right. We're going to move on. We watch Christmas movies and Christmas specials. Most of those things we've got memorized, but we still watch them, don't we? We get the house decorated. We get the lights just right. We freak out all the fire marshals because of all the open flames everywhere. 
We try to get things taken care of at work, don't we? We put it in a bunch of preparation at work so we're ready for the holidays so we can take some time off to spend with families. It's this ritual that we go through each and every year, isn't it? It's, it's, it's actually, can I say it this way? It's almost part of our liturgy. Like we have a, a, a preparation that we go through to get to Christmas. And there's this whole other level of preparedness that happens if you give gifts, isn't there? Gift giving is stressful. I don't like it. You know, unless you thank you, amen on that one. Unless you're like that person who is like has the spiritual gift of gift giving, I won't ask you to raise your hands because I don't want to, you know, embarrass you or have people throw things at you. But you know what I'm talking about? That person who has this uncanny ability throughout the entire year, like they see something at a thrift store in the middle of March and say, "Oh, I know who that. That's a perfect gift for so and so." Although, who who knows that person? Yeah. Who is that? No, I'm not going to do that. Sorry. <laughs> the rest of us, maybe some of us, we wrestle with gift giving. Maybe you might identify with one of these things. Maybe you're the, the, the re-gifter. Like the person who gets busted giving a gift card that's got like 10 cents left on it. <laughs> yeah, that happens, doesn't it? That's always the worst when you like re-gift something back to the person. It's been long enough that you gave it back to the original person. <laughs> How about the, the no-gifters? Like the person that shows up at something is like, oh, oh man, I was, I was supposed to bring something? <laughs> There's always that person in the room. Can I say this way? The one-uppers? Do you know what I'm talking about? Maybe the one-uppers were last year's no-gifters, right? Like they have, to, they have to make up for it the next year, right? Uh, how about the one-stoppers? Guys? Like, who gets the call from their credit card company, like, later that day? Yeah, there's been some unusual charges. You spent $400 at Quick Trip this morning. <laughs> Just be honest, right? And then there's God's other gift to the world, Amazon. It's not, worth, it's not on Amazon, it's not worth buying. No, I did not get paid for that. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> but have you ever been given a gift that's left you speechless? Think about that. Have you ever been given a gift when you opened it, think back through all the years, birthday gifts, Christmas gifts, whatever. Have you ever received a gift that left you speechless? Is there one or two gifts that just took you completely off guard? Things you weren't expecting. That one gift that was absolutely perfect in the moment that it was given. Maybe it was something you, you really wanted. Remember we talked about Ralphie last week and his Red Rider BB gun. That one gift. Maybe it was a gift that you had no idea you actually even wanted, but it was one of the most meaningful gifts you've ever received. Did you ever get that one gift that just left you, wow, anyone? Those are powerful, powerful moments. I get this feeling here in, from Paul in this verse in 2 Corinthians 9. Paul's writing the church at Corinth. He's written a couple letters to this church. They had some theology problems and some, some practical problems, some problems in how they they worshiped. But here in, in 2 Corinthians 9, the, the context of what's happening here in this verse is the entire chapter, Paul has encouraged them to live lives of generosity. And what they're doing, he's just taking time to talk about you, this, the church at Corinth. You need to invest in what's happening in the church so that other people come to faith. And he closes it out with this why. He just has this great conversation with them, but he pulls the entire thing back to their why. And he says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gifts. Other, other translations use the word inexpressible. There's another, another uh, older translations used to use the word unspeakable. Like there's this sense of, that Paul has that his, his knowledge, his idea, his identity in who Jesus is, he doesn't have the words to talk about it. And we, 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 you know, we try to give 
really meaningful gifts, don't we? We try to, we don't want to know our, the person that we're going to be giving gifts to. We want them to have it be something that's special, but I don't think there's any of us that can give gifts that are truly inexpressible or indescribable. Like, there's an entire industry about describing gifts, isn't there? Like, this is what marketers do. They spend hours and hours and hours coming up with the, the right combination of words and sometimes some pictures to get you to buy somebody's product, right? We're actually really dependent on those things. The, the, the science behind advertising is really interesting. Um, the, the, the feeling that most ads are trying to capture you with is they're trying to demonstrate that your life is actually missing something and that something that you're missing is what they are, with what they have. Your life is not complete until you have this in your life. Like who grew up? I'm a child of the 80s. So there was a big day every late fall, early part of winter. It was catalog day. You remember that? Yeah. Like Sears, you know, whoever. All the, it was usually the big department stores, right? The massive thick catalog. And what did it have in the very back of it? Toys. Toys. And it wasn't just toys, was it? It was pictures of kids who were happier than you <laughs> because they had the toys and you didn't. And so you circled the pictures or you, you dog-eared the pages or you left it in a really strategic spot for mom to come across, right? It doesn't change how we like act now because now we have wish lists and you know, we're just dog-earing or highlighting more expensive gifts because we're older now, right? And, and it's, the, it's the time of year as you're watching TV. I don't watch many ads because of DVRs now, but when I finally like, get caught up during the football games, I don't know how the car companies still get away with this, but like you get the ad every single year, right? Where the couple comes out and there's the pair of brand new matching $80,000 Mercedes sitting in the driveway, complete with bows and the perfectly groomed home and the, the driveway that's never seen snow on it ever. And you know, what's, what's the message of the commercial? Really, I, I love you so much, I, I got you a $2,000 car payment for Christmas. <laughs> but your life is not complete unless you have their, their cars. Can you imagine, with me for just a moment, a gift being so perfect, so timely, so beautiful, and so life-changing that it can't be described? A gift that's so thoughtful and so personal that your words actually fail. I, I love that feeling that comes from this verse. The indescribable gift. Paul's talking with the church at Corinth about leaning into lives of generosity, but he's reminding them about the value of the gift that they've been given in Jesus. The Living Bible, I love how actually how the Living Bible expresses this verse. It reads, I thank God for his son, this gift too wonderful for words. Isn't that great? I thank God for this gift too wonderful for words. This is the only time this word for indescribable appears in the whole of scripture. Actually, you know who I, who I see this in, some, in somebody who demonstrates this better than anyone on the entire planet? It's actually Pastor Bruce. Have you noticed that? When he talks about grace, when he talks about forgiveness, he talks about God's love, he, he literally can't talk, right? And what does he normally do? <laughs> I love that about him. It's, it's so powerful to see that gift expressed that way. I love the Christmas story. I love the accounts that we have in the gospel because it gives words, it gives vocabulary, it gives description to the indescribable. Three verses here, four verses here in Matthew chapter one. It gives us the context to our theme verse. 
Matthew 1, 18 through 21. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and here it is, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save the people from his sins. The most timely, the most powerful, the most personal, the most indescribable gift ever given. Jesus, the perfect gift given at just the right time. Last week we talked about finding hope in the middle of our circumstances. We talked about Jesus as the gift of hope, and it's, it's hard for me to really truly imagine what it must have felt, felt like, that the feeling of dread and the feeling of hopelessness that Israel and Judah experienced that we talked about last week. Since the beginning of God's story, God's people had been looking forward to the coming of their anointed one. Because of the sinfulness of his people and because of the sinfulness of their kings, because pe- people, the people of Israel, the people of Judah had chosen other gods instead of the one God. They walked away and they forgot whose people they really were. And we talked about Jeremiah. Jeremiah had this burden that he had to carry. He had a weight. He didn't get to bring a message of hope. He had to bring a message of judgment. And yet what was referenced today and what was in our our Advent reading, Isaiah got to bring the message of hope. He got to bring the message of who Messiah was going to be. Isaiah 7 through uh, 10 through 14, chapter 7, verses 10 through 14, was the prophecy that Matthew was actually quoting here in our theme verse, declaring Emmanuel, God with us. Matthew's retelling that prophecy for his readers. In chapter 9, there's some wonderful verses about when Messiah comes. Verse 2 and then verses 6 and 7. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. For a child is born to us, a son is given. A gift, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Isaiah would go on and He would describe the life that Messiah would live. And because of this language, Israel and Judah, God's people, they were looking at their immediate circumstances. And so many of them missed the eternal picture of what God was doing. They'd read from Isaiah that there would be really nothing remarkable about who Messiah was going to be. They would read that he would wind up being rejected by his own people. They would hear read in the temple as they unrolled the scroll of Isaiah that he would wind up suffering at the hand of others on their behalf, that he would be tortured and tormented and that his life would be given as a sacrifice for all. And yet even through all of that, even through all of the retellings, And through the 400 years of silence, so many of them missed it. So why do we take time to retell the story of Advent? Well, it's it's to remind ourselves. It's just to continually remind ourselves of the importance of this story. It's to put ourselves back into the story of the incarnation in that moment of anticipation, that in-between space 
of silence. The tension of preparation, waiting for revelation that was going to come in the gift of God's unfailing love to the world in the person of Jesus. We celebrate Advent, we celebrate Christmas to remind ourselves, to recenter our hearts and our minds and our spirits around this simple yet complex truth that Jesus was given to the world out of God's unconditional love to restore relationship between the Father and humanity. That's the greatest story ever told. Paul is, I can imagine Paul in that moment as he's writing that phrase. Actually, Paul was probably blind, and so, or nearly blind, so he's having somebody else write it. Can imagine him as he's reciting this, looking back over the story of his life, past, present, and future, about this indescribable gift of Jesus. I imagine Paul like Pastor Bruce as he looks back at his upbringing as a Pharisee, as a persecutor of the church and the grace and the mercy that he was given. And as he's writing that, he can't even go on. What's he do? I love you, Bruce. And he writes, it's, it's, it's this indescribable gift. It's, it's just Jesus. Jesus, that's the, actually the, like the, the English-sized version of the Greek name of a Hebrew name, Yeshua. Have you heard that name before? Yeshua it just simply means God is salvation. Paul puts language around the indescribable. It's what he puts, he takes so much time to help these churches understand this indescribable gift. And our words fail. And sometimes we get really worked up over songs when we don't understand the words. <laughs> But we're just trying to put our humanity, trying to express through our humanity this amazing, indescribable divinity. For us, we take these scriptures, these frozen moments in time, these ancient words that have been preserved through the ages, where we're retelling these stories, we're revisiting the incarnation and trying to make the indescribable describable. That's why we do a kid's pageant. It's not just to be entertained. And we will be, it's fun. But we want our kids to experience this story and retell this for themselves over and over and over again. Retelling these stories makes the indescribable describable. The indescribable becomes describable as we experience the fullness of who God is. Can I say it this way? The indescribable becomes describable when we experience our families being mended after years of dysfunction. The indescribable becomes describable when we experience our bodies being healed from sickness and infirmity and disease. The indescribable becomes describable when we experience that second chance, that third chance, that fourth chance that God offers The indescribable becomes describable when we experience the healing of our thought life and our inner monologue. The indescribable becomes describable when we experience that gift of unconditional love. It's hard to describe healing and forgiveness and restoration and comfort until we experience them, until we've experienced perfect hope and perfect love perfect joy and perfect peace that's been given in Jesus. It's hard for us to put language on those things. Retelling these stories, letting ourselves be reminded of God's fulfilled promises. That's what we talked about last week. It refreshes those experiences. It's why we tell these stories over and over and over again. It's just simply to remind ourselves. Christmas allows us to experience again and again and again to refresh and renew the anticipation of the coming Savior. That's the whole of Advent. It's just putting ourselves back into that moment of anticipation. We tell the story again and again and again to experience the hope, the love, the joy, and peace of the fulfilled promise of Messiah. It puts our hearts right back to that place when we had the indescribable revealed to us. Paul's able to see the indescribable in his life, the gift of hope, the gift of love. So we remind 
ourselves. We put ourselves back into that place where we feel the indescribable become describable. And it makes me think. It makes me just kind of stop and pause. I think somebody's really on to something. This is why we watch Christmas movies, right? Is the nostalgia, is the reminder, is to bring back feelings. We're nostalgic creatures. Nostalgia sells. We're wired for it. There's something beautiful and natural about the rhythm of reflection. Um, So we watch the same Christmas movies over and over and over again to evoke that particular feeling that we had. The best example, they got it going on. Hallmark Channel. That was a very knowing, "Mm mm-hmm, just then. They got it figured out. They have tapped into the rhythm. I went down the rabbit hole researching Hallmark movies this week. They've got the, they've perfected the pattern. Are you ready? Snow, Christmas, love, tension, and a happy, happily ever ending, a happily ever after ending. I'm not saying this with judgment. I'm saying it with admiration. They've got it figured out. And they're making mint. They've been telling this one story for decades. Just like swapping characters. I don't know how Candace Cameron Bure, is that her name? She's like in 20 of these things. And they all came out in the last two weeks. It's amazing. Listen to this. Hallmark Channel launched their movies, their Christmas movies, like in earnest in 2010. They had eight original movies in 2010. Are you ready? Buckle up. In 2014, they launched, they released 12 original movies. 2015, it went to 21. 2016, it was 28. In 20, these are original, uh, original, sorry. <laughs> Make sure I say it right. Original movies. 2017, it was 33 original movies. You know how many it was this year? 38. 38 movies. From the end of October through Christmas, it's the most watched cable channel in the, like the prime demographic of 18 to 54-year-olds. They made $390 million last year. Should we talk about Christmas prints from Netflix from last year? Did you see this last year? 18 days after being released, Netflix tweeted this out. Check this out. To the 53 people who've watched a Christmas prints every day for the last 18 days, who hurt you? So there's a couple things happening in this tweet, right? First, there's the obvious. There are 53 people who have watched this movie 18 days straight. The second thing is how creepy is it that Netflix knows that? That's their job, right? Let's just admit it. Netflix knows what you're watching. That's amazing. It's amazing. Then they had a thing as I was reading an article, they had someone last year, 20, so 2017, who watched the B movie, like, you know, the Jerry Seinfeld movie about bees, the B movie, 370 times in one year. Just saying, my son is clapping. <laughs> oh, Jesus, help me. It's part of our rhythm, isn't it? My family, we've got three Christmas movies that we watch every single year. And until we watch those movies, it's not really Christmas. Anyone else? I'm not going to tell you what they are. (laughs) One of them for me, I have a movie that I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it is not generally considered a Christmas movie, but I count it as a Christmas movie. I'm not saying what movie it is. I'm not saying 
But it really, it really doesn't feel like Christmas until we watch these movies together. Elf is one of them. We just finally got through it. It took us three nights to get through Elf. Isn't that crazy? But this is part of our rhythm. And we, we, we all kind of do this, right? Like it's not Thanksgiving unless you've watched Charlie Brown Christmas. And then the next night, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is on. Like CBS knows the rhythm. They've done, been doing it for like 60 years, right? But we laugh and we tell stories and we reminisce and we talk over the movie. It's really just background noise as cookies are happening and all those kinds of things. But honestly, this is that nostalgia, that feeling, that kind of bringing all of us back together is why we tell this Christmas story over and over and over again. It's part of our preparation. It's part of our anticipation. It's part of the rhythm of Advent. And I actually think it's something that's really beautiful about this time of year is we just slow down. We tell the same story that we've heard over and over and over again and just allow that story to recenter us as Christ followers. It's part of the building anticipation of Emmanuel, God with us. It puts words to the indescribable. It puts words to the gift of hope the demonstrated faithfulness of God. It puts words to the indescribable gift of love, that unfailing, unconditional gift of love from God. And it's just Jesus. We just take these weeks, these days, these moments, and just allow our hearts to be recaptured by him. Can I just say it that way? That's what this is all about. And like Paul, we're able to look back over the course of our lives as we followed Jesus. And we can look back and we can see the darkness. We can see how far we fell short, the failures, the shortcomings. We can look back and we can see the hopelessness that we felt before Jesus. We look back and we see the patterns of sin and brokenness and shame. But then when we experience that moment where that indescribable gift of love, forgiveness, and hope entered our lives, the indescribable became describable. Something happened inside of us. And I told you, I, Paul's my guy. and I, I, I so frequently come back to him because he made the indescribable describable. He put language that as people were wrestling with, what does this really even mean? What is this whole Christ following thing was new in the first century? And we have the benefit of his wisdom. Look at Romans 6, 22 and 23. But now that you've found you don't have to listen to sin to tell you what to do and have discovered the delight of listening to God telling you, what a surprise. A whole, healed, put together life right now with more and more life on the way. Work hard for your sin your whole life and your pension is death. Other translations, what do they say? The wages of sin, the cost, the price, the penalty is death. But God's what? What? Somebody, I say it out loud. God's what? Gift is eternal life. God's gift is real life, eternal life, delivered by Jesus, our master. We look back over our lives and see the demonstrated love of God. Like last week, we looked to the gift of hope to see the demonstrated faithfulness of God. Today, we look back and we see the demonstrated love of God. We remind ourselves that this gift of love was so powerful that we tell other people about it. That's, that's the why, that's what we're getting to today. We tell ourselves the Christmas story again and again and again to remind ourselves to step back into the anticipation of Messiah. We allow ourselves to feel the indescribable gift of love that's found in Jesus, not so we can just have a little warm fuzzy, have our Jesus moment and our little advent calendar. We're given as a gift. We're given as a gift. We allow ourselves to feel the indescribable gift of love that's found in Jesus in order to demonstrate God's love to the world. Paul again in Ephesians chapter two. 
God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he did what? Gave. He gave us life when we, he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us, look at that. God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us. We're actually given as a gift to the world to demonstrate God's love as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. And here's my favorite part. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for it. It is a gift from God. It's not a reward for the good things we've done. None of us can boast about it because we can't earn it. We're God's masterpiece. What do artists do with masterpieces? Somebody paints a masterpiece, what do they do? Box it up and put it in storage so no one can see it, right? No, you put it on a wall. You put lights on it so everybody can see it. We're God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us to do long ago. How ridiculous is that? That's a ridiculous plan. Jesus gives us a gift in order to demonstrate his unconditional love for people. Why? Why? Like, I I imagine Jesus being asked that question at one point of, well, you you remember he said it was better that he went away? Do you remember that scripture? It's better that I go away. And he says, no, uh, the better plan is that I go away so I can send you the Holy Spirit so you can be the demonstration. I I think the only reason the the why behind that is because he knows that people need him and his strength is demonstrated better through us. I don't, there's this mystery behind that. But there's something powerful that happens. See, we might never know the hurt, the brokenness, the pain, the shame that someone is experiencing when we cross paths with them. But Jesus does. We might never truly know the set of circumstances behind somebody's story, but Jesus does. And as Jesus meets people and demonstrates his love through us, he meets people in a powerful way. And part of me says, that's a terrible plan, Jesus. Because I, I know me. I know my story. I know my brokenness. I know the places where I fell short. And we all know that, right? But in the midst of our own darkness, we were shown a great light. Isn't that the beautiful part of that scripture from Isaiah? In the middle of darkness, we were shown a great light. And now we get to be that light for other people. It's not a have to, it's a get to. God's inviting us to be this person for other people. The gift of love is Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And he's given, he's been given as a gift of God's unfailing love to the world. Jesus was the demonstration of God's love to the entire world. He was given to make all things right, given to restore the relationship between God and humanity. And we retell the story of God with us to remind ourselves of the darkness that we've been brought out of. So we put our hearts and our minds, our spirits back into that place of anticipation of a savior so that we can remember what it felt like when the indescribable became describable in our lives. Forgiveness restoration, healing, comfort, provision, hope, love, joy, and peace. Why? Why do we remind ourselves of this gift? So that we can make the indescribable describable to somebody else. Because we might be the only Jesus that someone else ever meets. Can I say that again? You just hear that down at the very level of your spirit today, you might be the only Jesus someone meets. So 
what Jesus are they meeting? There's a world that's living in darkness that's full of people who have yet to meet Jesus. And Jesus loves them as much as he loves you. And he wants to use you to meet them. It's full of people that might never set foot in a church. It's full of people who might never open a Bible, but they're people that you meet every single day. What Jesus are they meeting? We love because Christ loved us. Unconditional love was freely given to us. Now unconditional love is to be freely given by us. Can I say that one more time? Just let that soak in. Unconditional love was freely given to us and now unconditional love is freely given by us. How blessed are we to have received God's love? But now we're blessed to be a blessing. We're called to be a gift of love to somebody else. Paul dedicated his life to this, words and action. His life was to show other people the describable behind this indescribable gift. He said, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The gift of God's unfailing love to the world is Jesus. Jesus, given to the world out of love to restore right relationship between God and humanity. So now we get to be, we get to be, it's a privilege, we get to be the gift of love to demonstrate it to the world. We show the world who Jesus is. People need us to make the indescribable describable. Jesus meets people in their moment of need through us because we're the demonstration of Jesus and Jesus is the gift of hope and he is the gift of love. I'm going to invite you to stand and just as, because I love the anticipation behind the words of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We're going to sing that song one more time. John and the, the team are going to lead us in that. It's a, it's a wonderful song of this building anticipation. Can we, can we sing this one more time? And just a, a little different than what we've done in the past, rather than waiting to the, the end of the service. I'm going to actually invite our elders to come forward right now, actually, during, during this song. Do you need prayer? If you need to talk to somebody, that we're going to worship. I'm actually going to, can I ask if we can have these blinds closed just so it's not so bright in here, just to help with the, with the, with the atmosphere here. But I want to invite you, if you need prayer for something, if you came needing to receive from God this morning, as we sing this song, um, I'm just going to invite you to come. So however you need to respond, however you need to respond this morning, let's be people who just revisit this anticipation of the gift of love. John, will you lead us this morning?